Well, hello, my name's Gordon Palmer. Welcome to our service at uh, Clement Parish Church for the August the 2nd. On the first Sunday of the month now, we'll be celebrating communion as part of our service, and you're welcome if you love and follow the Lord Jesus to share with us in the communion part of the service. Um, because we're all in different places, though, you'll have to provide your own bread and wine or, or substitute. So if you've been cut short by that, didn't expect that, you can you know, hit a pause button and go and get that part sorted out. As well as myself, um, in taking part in the service today, Miriam Murphy will be leading us in our opening prayer. Um, Martin Russell will be doing the Bible reading, and Morag Drumgold leading us in our prayers for others. Jesus, in John 7, stands before a crowd, and he says this, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, Rivers of living water will flow from within them. We focus on that giving life of Jesus as we, in a sense, race through that story of his life and our first hymn from the squalor of a borrowed stable. Let's pray. Gracious Father, you who know our thoughts and deeds, you who hold our hearts in full understanding, you who decipher us better than ourselves, we trust you. We trust you when days are just the same as always, and we trust you also on the days of change, 
of chaos and of uncertainty. We have come together to praise you as a church community, side by side, shoulder to shoulder. We are thankful for the gift of others around us who know and love you and who are part of this one family in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are thankful for all the people who you have put across our path and with whom we have shared some of our journey. Although we hurt when we have lost loved ones, but we thank you for the impact they have had in our lives and how you've caused us to love them even though we have now lost them from our view. God has given, God has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You have given and you have given us plenty and at times you take away and even then we choose to thank you. We trust your wisdom even when it's difficult we trust in your guidance and your providence in each situation, and we worship you, Lord Jesus. Jesus, you said to your curious disciples to be, come and see. Come and see where I live. Come and see how I live. Come and see how I interact with people. Fall in love with my ways of living. Wonder and amaze in my character and quirkiness. For I am the God, the creator, full of playfulness, joy and deep felt love. So each Sunday we come and see and we come and marvel and we come and learn. And we come with hearts humbled, acknowledging that our hearts are not always right with you. That our ways are not your ways and our thoughts are not your thoughts. And we realize our need for forgiveness each day. So forgive us, Lord when we have fallen short in deeds and thoughts and in actions not done. As a worshipping community, together we pray with the very words your Son taught us to pray. We pray, Our, Our Father, Father in, in heaven, heaven. Good morning, everybody. Our reading today is taken from the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. The Gospel of John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Let us listen for God's Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the, word did do, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. 
Out of his fullness we have all received grace, in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Amen. And thanks be to God for this reading. And to his name be the praise and the glory. There's an amazing set of figures that I've mentioned before in services, um, worked out a number of years ago by folks in Evangelism Explosion. Um, two different scenarios. So imagine in, in one scenario, there may be a, a successor to Billy Graham or whoever, some, some evangelist who um, is willing to go right across the world, who preaches to crowds. And let, let's imagine that that evangelist, every, every night um, when he preaches to the crowd, no fewer than 1,000 people come forward and respond. 1,000 people every night say that they want to give their lives to following Jesus. The evangelist travels, as I say, across the place. He never takes any time off, uh, no holidays. Every night he's doing this, except he's going to have to live for a long time because even at that rate, even this preaching every night, 1,000 people a night becoming Christians, it would take some 10,000 years, 10,000 years for the whole world to come to faith. And then a second scenario. In the second scenario, um, we're supposed that every Christian in the world shared their faith with someone and led one person over a year to faith in Christ. And that continued year after year. One person sharing their faith with one other person so that one person becomes a Christian every year and led to Christ. And that process continues. That way, it doesn't take 10,000 years for the whole world to become Christian. It doesn't even take 1,000 or 100 years. It's done, in fact, in 32 years. The big evangelist, the famous evangelist, the crowds, a thousand, pounds, a thousand people a night, 10,000 years. One Christian leading another friend or family member to faith in Christ, each year, 32 years. So which of the two is more effective? And furthermore, all recent studies about how people become Christians, how people come to faith, have shown that the way that most people come to faith is via the witness of a friend or, or a family member. It's not going to meetings. It's not via church services. It's not through the minister. It's not leaflets. All of these things have their place. I'm not saying don't do any of them, but it's primarily through the witness of a friend and family member that most folks become Christians. Well, as I said, I've used that illustration before, and we've been here before in terms of wanting to encourage folks to share faith. And we're going to come back to the theme of evangelism a fair bit in the coming year. It, partly because, of course, it's a ripe time. I'm not sure how much lasting change there will be because of the pandemic experience we've been through. But it does raise issues and questions that life is not as secure as we thought, not as comfortable as we thought, not as untouchable as we thought. We don't manage as much or as well as we thought. And there are more questions about life and what's valuable in life, and more questions about what's beyond death. And the church must take its opportunities to, to raise these questions and pursue these questions. And there's two tools to do that that I want to mention. The first of them, uh, come and see, is something that we've um, used here in Claremont for a number of years now. And I also uh, want to uh, refer, I've not got the book with me, but to a, a series called Word One to One, something that I've only come across recently. Word one-to-one -one is materials to help us to sit down and share Scripture, in this case, John's Gospel, and to invite someone for a, for a chat and, and to look at John's Gospel together. Come and See is a shorter series. It just involves five gatherings, five meetings with someone. 
And the latest draft that I've done is to make it more easy for anyone, for everyone, to be able to use this with a friend or with a family member. And so we're going to provide copies for you. We want you to be talking to other folk about Jesus and the materials here. The themes um, of Come and See we're also going to be looking at in the services through this month of August. Who, who is Jesus? Why did he come? How did he become a savior? What happened after that, Jesus? And so what? What is our response to that? And so I want to begin as that, where that begins with saying, who is Jesus? And <clears throat> as well as word one-to-one, -one, beginning in John's gospel at chapter one, so too, I want to go there um, this morning, and it's why we had Martin reading, reading that passage for us. In these verses in John's gospel, we see two main things stressed that are emphasized in this first um, meaning at come and see. Firstly, that there's a message that comes to us from beyond, from outside of us, and it's good news. And secondly, that message is about Jesus. For Christianity, you see, is not something that we make up. It's something that is given to us, revealed to us, and shown to us by God. Left to ourselves, we can have no idea about who God is or what He's like. We cannot from ourselves, from within ourselves, or from among ourselves say, right, we've now got this worked out, this is, this is who God is. People have built statues and images galore, and they do not accurately portray God. People say they, take, they experience God and, and see His touch maybe in a fantastic sunset or hilltop view, and, but that experience of something beyond us, that experience of something numinous doesn't describe to us who God is or what He wants. We just simply don't know and cannot work out who or what the Creator is like, what He wants of us, expects from us, whether He's a person at all or just simply some life force. We cannot be sure if He wants offerings, wants to be prayed to, or simply left in peace. From within creation, in fact, we cannot say very much at all about the one who is beyond creation. But that's not stopped people trying to. Philosophers and the theist tradition say God is the word for some supreme absolute being about whom we might not know very much. The deists say God made the world and set it in motion, just as the watchmaker makes a watch and winds it up and leaves it to do its thing and tell the time. A Hindu would tell you something else. A Hindu would say that he or she is God because, well, God's in everything. God's part of everything, and so on. So how do we sort all these things out? How can we, who's right? Well, in one sense, we cannot prove anything, but Christian faith rests on this claim that God has made himself known to us and made himself known to us in Jesus. And so verse 3 of John 1, through him, the word, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And this Word who has made everything, verse 3, has become one of us. Verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And because of that, even though we ourselves have not seen God, we can know who He is because, verse 18, no one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is Himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father has made Him known. The Creator, verse 3, has become a creature, one of us, verse 14. And because this, he is both creator and creature, he has made it known to us. He has brought God's presence to us. Try to imagine, suppose that you were in a, a totally darkened room, no light switch, and you've no idea how you got there. You've just woken up, and there you are in a completely blacked out room. You might try and find out bits and pieces about your surroundings. You might try and fumble your way around, try and see how big or how small is this room. You'll do it all very gingerly because you're not very sure what's there and you don't want to put your hand onto something that's sharp or something that's messy. But then someone comes and makes a window, a large space, a large window in one of the walls, and light blazes in. 
Well, now you can see much better what's in the room. You might not see everything into every corner, but you're certainly in a much better position than you were before. But more than that, you can also see out of the window. You can see something that's beyond this limited place where you were. Well, Jesus is much like that window. He is light, verse 5 in John chapter 1. He is the one who has shone His light so that we can see more of life and what it's like, understand better the place we have in this world, but also we can see outside, we can see beyond, we can see something of who the Creator is and what He's like. It's not something that we've deduced from ourse- for ourselves. It's not something that we've invented or made with our hands. Rather, it is the Creator, it is the eternal God breaking into our world, shining His light into our world. The Christian faith rests on this, that it's a word of God, a word from God. And secondly, it's a message that's good news and rests entirely on the identity of Jesus. And this come and see leaflet, you'll see, we focus on two particular things about Jesus' claims. One, that He forgave others, and secondly, that He allowed people to worship Him. There were, in their own ways, incredible claims that He was one with God, that He was divine that although He has come to us in the world, verse 9 of John 1, although He's become flesh and truly moved in alongside us, verse 14, He has done so as the eternal Word described in verses 1 to 3. It is the Son of God, it is the Word of God who comes and dwells among us. And He has moved in, had a complete sharing of our experiences, and even tough experiences at that the experience of being born in the poverty of a manger, having to flee into Egypt as a a refugee when still an infant, the notoriety of being friend of tax collectors and sinners, having nowhere, he said, to lay his head, having to borrow a room for the Passover meal. It was a whole new range of experiences for the Son of God, to have a father and a mother, to have brothers and sisters, new relationships with disciples, with scribes and Pharisees, with Roman soldiers, with lepers, prostitutes, high priests. And He came and lived all of that as one of us, not in sublime detachment, not in ascetic isolation, but with us. And there was no large estate that gave Him space no financial capital to guarantee his daily bread, no personal staff to protect him from interruptions, no might to protect him from injustice. And it is the Word who did that, the eternal Son, verse 18, who did that. He was in the world, verse 10. And even though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. It's astonishing. And these are the claims that Jesus made. And as we read through the Gospels, we see many splendid things that He did, many astonishing miracles and wise teachings. But He's making it clear that it, He Himself understands that this is God, He is God come in the flesh. As I say, not least because He forgave people their sins. Now, it might make sense for me to say, I I forgive you if you steal 50 pounds from me. Um, I might not, so don't try it, by the way, but but it would make sense uh, if I said, I forgive you. But if you stole 50 pounds from somebody else, somebody I'd never even met, how could I say to you, well, I forgive you? They're, They're over there thinking, wait a minute, I've still got 50 quid to get. But Jesus did that. Jesus didn't just say to people, I forgive you for the time that you've tripped me up, or I've forgiven you for the time that you've called me names. He forgave across the board because God could. And as Jesus said to people, your sins are forgiven, so the people heard what He was saying and knew that He was claiming to be God. In a similar way, he lived in a time and a place where 
only God was worshipped. And Jesus allowed people to give him that kind of acclaim. And indeed, even as he entered Jerusalem on the day that we call Palm Sunday, and the scribes and the Pharisees said, this is going a bit too far, it's all a bit too much, shut them up. Jesus said, even if the people stopped, the very stones would cry out. He deserves worship. And so Jesus, then, cannot be just simply a good man. Too many people come to that conclusion, and it's an impossible conclusion. For no good man would claim to be God if he wasn't. It would not be a good thing if someone told you that your sins were forgiven if they did not have the right and the power to do so. It wouldn't be good to say to you, you can have eternal life if he did not have any way of providing that. And certainly would not be good that he would say, stick with me and I'll give you eternal life, as in fact he did. You've maybe heard people say things to you like, well, stick with me and I'll show you a good time. Stick with me and I'll show you how this is done. Well, Jesus said, stick with me and I will show you God. Stick with me and I will introduce you to the Father. Stick with me and I will take you into eternal life. Now, it's not a good man who says those kind of things if he doesn't know the way, doesn't have access to the Father, cannot grant eternal life. In fact, it would be criminal for someone to make those kind of claims and promises if he couldn't deliver on them. So, in this first sheet, and come and see, and as I say, I want to be making it available when um, over time we'll build up in the others in the series and to encourage you to think about sharing these with others. In this first one, there's two simple points. By ourselves, we don't know, we cannot find God, but God has revealed Himself to us. And God has come to us in Jesus, God in the flesh. For no one has ever seen God, but the, only, the one and only Son who is Himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father has made Him known. Verse 18 of John 1. Looking back over these 18 verses in a book that he wrote as a series of studies through the Advent season, Tim Chester gives us this summary of Jesus. Jesus is a true Adam who has come to recreate our humanity. Jesus is a true God, the uncreated Creator God. Jesus is the Word through whom we hear the voice of God. Jesus is the Word through whom God created the world and through whom God is recreating the world. Jesus is the one who has been given life in Himself and so can give His life to His people. Jesus is the true light who enlightens our minds and lights up our lives. Jesus is the point at which heaven and earth intersect. Jesus is God in the flesh, deity squeezed into human form. Jesus is divine wisdom, love, holiness, justice, truth in human form. Jesus is God among us, God's address on earth. Jesus is the glory of God, the embodiment of all His perfections. Jesus is God's native language, the Word that we encounter in the Bible. Jesus is the way home to God. Jesus is the King who cares for us, the bread who satisfies us, and the light who guides us. Jesus is the radiance of God, whose glory transforms us as we gaze upon Him. Jesus is the Son of God, in whom we experience the love of the Father. Jesus is the altogether lovely one who brings us into the loving arms of, of His Father. Is that not good news? If that is true, is that not of crucial importance? If that is real, surely that is worth sharing. 
So who could you tell? Who could you share with? That it is telling to, about Jesus and pointing to Jesus takes away the pressure from us of the issue about whether or not we are good enough. We're, Christians are not saying we're better than any others. We're not saying that we know more or are cleverer than anyone else. We're simply saying, look to Christ, for this is who He is. For God has not left us scrambling around in the dark. He has shone His light into the world. And that light is the one who gives us eternal life. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the life and for the love of Jesus come among us. Help us to know him better, to better grasp and focus on all he is to us and all he offers us in love. Amen. We're going to sing the hymn, Here is Love. And after we've sung that hymn, Morag Drumgold is going to be leading us in our prayers for others. And then we'll sing the communion hymn, Jesus Calls Us Here to Meet Him. together this morning to pray for others, I'm going to begin with just reciting a few lines that will be uh, fairly familiar to most of us, I think. Can I ask that after each phrase, you could maybe just repeat it, even silently to yourself, while just focusing on the fact that God is with us wherever we are. He hears our prayers wherever or whenever we pray, and that he is listening to our prayers right now. Let's pray together. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. Be still for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. Be still, for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. Gracious Father, as we come before you now, we marvel that you, the creator of the universe, invite us into your presence. We marvel that when we open our eyes and look around us, we can see your glory shining in your marvellous creation. And we marvel that when we come together in prayer, we can feel your power moving amongst us wherever we are. We thank you for loving us beyond our understanding and for being with us and hearing our prayers. As we're still living through this strange, restricted time, we thank you for all those who are still working tirelessly to keep us safe and to care for those who are ill, frail and vulnerable. We truly ne will never be able to repay them for their dedication in so many different spheres. But you know who they are, Lord. We ask you to bless them. We pray for our leaders worldwide and local and ask 
While we understand that they must work towards getting the economy up and running, they will keep the safety and well-being of all the people at the heart of their decisions. Lord, we're already seeing disagreements and hearing caustic comments and insults being hurled around between the most powerful leaderships in your world. Please give them the wisdom to put their differences aside and work together to heal this broken world. We pray for those who are already struggling with poverty, disease, homelessness, displacement, abuse, war and injustice and to now have to cope with the threat of COVID as well. We ask that help would be there for them, for all of them, and we pray too for those willing to go in among these crisis situations to give aid and support. We pray for those who feel they are unjustly treated because of their colour, nationality, ethnic origins or religion. And we pray especially for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Please ease their situation, Father, and keep very close to them. As we come to your table together today, Lord, we think on the vision in Revelations, where the Apostle John writes, And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Please help us, Father, to work at coming together to celebrate the wonder of being children of the living God. Show us how to love one another as you love us and to remember that in you no one is excluded. We pray for our ministry team and leadership here in Claremont and we thank you that we have been able to remain a family even during this time of physical separ separation. As we begin to look at how we can best move forward while still restricted, please guide us on the path you have planned for us. Help us to be a beacon which attracts those who are in despair of the future and for those who might be beginning to wonder if Jesus could really make a difference to them. Please don't let us miss any opportunity you put in our way. This time has shown us that your church is definitely not a building and that we can and must reach out in other ways, simply other ways other than simply opening the church doors on a Sunday morning. Ways that the community can see and connect to. Father God, none of us, whether we are powerful politicians or humble servants, can do anything worthwhile without your loving guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us, we pray, to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us so that you can use each one of us as tools to build up your kingdom here on earth, so that everyone will know your presence, will see your glory shining all around, and will feel your power moving in their place. Hear us, Heavenly Father, as in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.
Well, we gather together to celebrate the sacrament of communion. We, as we've just sung, meet to be with Jesus. Jesus calls us here to, to meet him. And it deliberately chose a hymn that, that stressed the um, gathering together. Because although we're not in the one place, although we're not able to meet together at uh, Claremont as one congregation, we do believe that through faith, that through the presence of God's Holy Spirit, we are united. We are together, not just with one another, but also with the, with the Lord himself. And all who love Jesus as their Lord, all who have committed themselves to be following him, are welcome to share with us in the gifts of bread and wine as we, as we share together around this table. Karen's going to be reading from us, from 1 Corinthians, the words of the Apostle Paul as he gives us the basis for gathering for the meal. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. And he comes to us in grace and we receive in, in faith. So let us confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And the words of our creed will appear on the screens. I believe in Let us pray. Gracious God, our Lord and our God, we lift our hearts to you in praise and thanksgiving. We lift to you hearts that are full of wonder and adoration. You invite us, you call us, and you invite and you call us on the basis of Christ being a Savior, Christ being one provided for us. We gather in fellowship, though we're in different places. But we also gather in fellowship with all who have trusted you in every age and every place. And together we honor you and praise your holiness. We thank you for the love of Jesus, who came among us to stand where we stand, flesh of our flesh. We thank you that he was no stranger to the dark night or to the deep sorrow and we thank you that on the cross he knew the weight of guilt, the pain of death, even the hell of separation with, from you, Heavenly Father. And still he went on loving, still he went on caring. And we thank and praise you that the crucified one was raised again, and that from his death comes life, from his judgment comes forgiveness, and from his forsakenness comes the promise that we shall never be forsaken. We thank and we praise you that your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the crucified and risen Jesus, is at work in our world, bringing light to its dark corners and establishing your coming kingdom of peace and of love and of justice. We thank you too that your Spirit is a Spirit of hope, a deposit, looking forward and looking to the redemption of our humanity and the reconciliation of all peoples. And now we ask that the spirit of hope and joy and thankfulness 
may be poured out on us and upon the bread and the wine, uniting us in communion with the body and blood of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. So we recall how our Lord Jesus uh, gathered around the table with his followers on that very night in which he was betrayed. He took bread, and after he'd given thanks to God for it and blessed it, he, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, it's being broken for you. Do this, remembering me. And later he took the cup, and he said, this cup is a new covenant made in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink it, drink it, remembering me. And so these then are the gifts of God for the people of God. So take and eat the body of Christ, and it was broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed that the sins of many might be forgiven. Drink from it, remembering him. The blood of Christ. <clears throat> Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for every taste of your goodness, for the new life that is in Christ and the life of Christ that nurtures and strengthens us day by day. Help us to be strengthened and blessed through all of your goodness to us. And may we rise from here as people fed, people enabled and strengthened to go loving and sharing and caring and serving in the world to your glory. Amen. And our closing hymn is Meekness and Majesty.
now may the grace of 